tonight. We thank you for everything that you've done for us so far. Um, we thank you for um, the, time, the time of fellowship. We thank you um, just for everything you've done for us. We pray that you would encourage us tonight. We pray that you would strengthen us tonight and help us to continue to dig into your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, so today um, I have a message called um, Managing Your Sorrow and Your Sweat. Managing Your Sorrow and Your Sweat. Take it down a little bit. I'm going to turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3. Managing Your Sorrow and Your Sweat. Talk about the realities of life and how we manage them. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So the serpent that deceived Eve and Adam was cursed. And then in verse 15, he said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Okay? The woman is the enemy of the serpent. Okay? And between thy seed and her seed. The seed of the woman is the enemy of the serpent. And it said, It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise its heel. And so, when a woman has a child, that child is the enemy of the devil. Okay? And that's also a prophecy concerning Jesus. Jesus is the seed that the woman was called to have, right? Because Jesus was born without a father, right? He was born of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is the, um, the seed of the woman that is the enemy of the serpent, okay? But the devil is against <laughs> godly seed. So that's the first point to understand, okay? Verse 16, unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. So part of the curse and the punishment for the woman is that her sorrow and her conception, uh, the sorrow and her conception will be multiplied. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Then in verse 17, And to Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I have commanded thee, saying, um, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So the curse to the serpent was he would be low, right? And that uh, he would be cursed above all cattle. Um, the punishment for the woman is that the multiplication of sorrow in her in her conception. In sorrow shall she bring forth children, and her desire shall be for her husband, and he shall rule over her. And then Adam, to Adam, he said, Cursed is the ground. The ground was cursed for Adam's sake, okay? In sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life, it shall bring forth thorns and thistles. And it said, in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. Okay, so the woman has sorrow in their conception and then they're bringing forth children. The man has sorrow um, in his, what does it say, in, in his eating. The man has to work hard in his sorrow and his labor and in his sweat. Okay, so we're talking your sorrow and managing your sweat. How do we manage that comes in our life? 
how do we manage the sweat <laughs> that comes in our life? The sweat and the sorrow. Okay, the women have the sorrow in their uh, their sorrow in their conception. The men have their sorrow in their sweat. So in the sweat of your brow shall you eat. A man has to work. You know, he was having an easy time picking fruit from the garden. Everything was provided for him. <laughs> no sorrow. There was no sorrow for Eve. There was no sorrow for Adam. But after sin, the sorrow came. The sweat came. Okay, so this is the world we live in. How do we manage that for the glory of God? How do we manage that in the gospel? How do we manage our sorrow and our sweat? How does God deliver us from our sorrow? How does he deliver us from our sweat? Okay, let's go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3 verse, let's see, Exodus 3 verse 7, and Yahuwah said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry, everybody say cry, cry. by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Okay, so they cried out to the Lord. He heard their cry, number one. Number two, he saw that what the taskmasters were doing to them, and he saw their sorrow in their work. So he saw their sorrow in their tears, and he saw their sorrow in their sweat. And guess what? He responded, and he sent Moses to be a deliverer. And Moses was a seed, was came from a woman, right? And she, as a baby, she put him in the water to save him from being killed. Okay, so we have, that's the first instance where Satan moved on a government leader to kill all the male children because he knew that there was a liver coming from the male children. Okay, and then if you look at um, Matthew, Herod, what did he do when Jesus was coming? killed all the male children of the Jews, right? Okay, now if you fast forward to 1973, United States of America, what happened? Roe versus Wade, okay, where the eugenics movement started to try to put abortion clinics in all the major cities so that they could kill and attack the young men. And even this week, what have we seen spread out all over the news? Okay, the killing of another Hebrew man, <laughs> you know, with no justice, right? And so there's a concerted attack on the Holy Seed. There's a concerted attack on certain groups of people to attack their men. And this is consistent throughout history. How does God deliver when we cry out in our sorrow and in our sweat? That's when God delivers. He said... I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. When God sees our, our sorrow and he sees our sweat, then he sends deliverance. And Satan can sense when deliverance is coming, and that's when he ups the attack. Satan actually turns up the attack on the seed. <laughs> he turns up the attack on the men when he sees that deliverance is coming from that generation. Okay? So how do women usually cry out to, to the uh, to the most high? With tears. Okay? Men cry too with tears, but women tend to be more emotional and cry out to, to the most high with tears. How do men cry out? Men cry out with their sweat. Okay? He said, in the sweat of your brow shall you eat. God saw the taskmasters. The taskmasters were afflicting sweat <laughs> and not paying them for it, right? He saw that the taskmasters were afflicting them and he saw their sorrow. So he saw their sorrow and he saw their sweat. He saw their tears and he saw their sweat and he answered them. Psalms 105. 
be about your paged turning finger. Cause we're gonna go through a lot of scriptures. I'm gonna try to go fast, but we still got a lot of scriptures. Psalms 105 verse 37. So when God actually answered their sorrow and their sweat, what happened? He delivered them. The spirit of Satan through Pharaoh tried to kill all the young men, but it didn't happen. One got out, one got through, and he was able to deliver. Um, God was able to use him to deliver the Hebrews, right? In verse 37, it says, He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Okay, so God delivered them. God delivered them. He saw their sorrow, he saw their sweat, he saw their tears, and he delivered them. He brought them out with wealth, with silver and gold, and they were strong. Not one was feeble. And what do we know happened after that? He gave them his commandments, he gave them his laws, he gave them his statutes, he gave these people, he made them a nation, um, he made them his priests to bring forth the Messiah. Uh, sometime in the future and he gave them you know a covenant he said if you do these you can be my people I'll be your God you know you do these things you'll be blessed you violate these things you'll be cursed so let's go to Deuteronomy 28 Deuteronomy 28, verse 65. He says, um, actually, let's go to verse 64. And Yahuwah shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there shalt thou serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease. Neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but Yahuwah shall give you there a trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. As that word sorrow. So when we fell into the curse, we went to a place of sorrow instead of the blessing. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have none assurance of thy life. And we've experienced that this past week, right? We've seen the dude get shot. And the dude has been shot dead since February 23rd. And we're just not hearing about it. And dudes haven't even, the killers not, have not even been put in prison. And so we're living through this right now. The sorrow of mine. Your life hanging in doubt before thee. None assurance of thy life. Okay? In a scattered land. We're in a, a scattered in a land that is not ours. Obviously, we're obviously we we're not we don't count, right? Um, and so there's sorrow there, but how can we use that sorrow for our good? How can we use that sorrow for our deliverance? Okay, God has a pattern. He has a way. Just like in Exodus, He saw their sorrow. He saw their tears. He saw their sweat, right? And he responded. He can do the same thing. Again, when in a, in a when we're scattered in a land that is not ours, he can do the same thing. If we manage our sorrow and we manage our sweat, God will send deliverance. Amen? Let's go to 1 Samuel 1.15. First Samuel chapter one, there's another instance in the, the kingdom of Israel where they need a deliverer. They've got a lots of ignorance, they've got all these judges, they keep falling back into sin. And there's a woman, her name is Hannah. Everybody say Hannah. Hannah, Hannah she did not have a what? A son. Remember what I said? The seed of the woman is the enemy of the devil enemy of the serpent 
she was a woman. She had sorrow. She she wanted a child, but she did not have one. First Samuel one chapter fifteen. It said Hannah answered and said, "Well, let's read first uh, thirteen. Now Hannah she spake in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought we, she had been drunken. Eli said unto her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your wine from thee. Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. She was a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. See, if we use our sorrow to pour out our soul before the Lord, he will answer. Amen. How did God answer her? He gave her a, a son. A son, and his her son ended up being Samuel. And Samuel was the greatest priest that Israel had up to that point. He was he walked in the office of a priest, he walked in the office of a prophet, he walked in the office of a king. And he was a great deliverer. He brought Israel together and had them keeping his commandments. And so God will send deliverance when we use our sorrow, when we manage our sorrow, and we manage our sweat correctly, God will send deliverance through our seed. Amen? This is good preaching. It is. It's good, ain't it? Ain't this good? Woo-wee. I'm excited. <laughs> Let's go to 2 Samuel. Um, actually, I'll just read 2 Samuel. We don't need to go there. 2 Samuel 22, 6, it said, The sorrows of hell compass me about. The snares of death prevented me. Okay, so when we're trapped in a situation that's in a situation that's evil, it's the sorrows of hell. Okay? Um, let's go to Ecclesiastes 1.18. I'll just read it so we can uh, get through it. Ecclesiastes 1.18 says, And much wisdom is much Increaseth in knowledge, increaseth in sorrow. Mm. Okay, so when you see more about what's going on in the world, when you increase in knowledge, sometimes it makes you sad, like, oh, I can't believe this is going on, right? You get sad, you get sorrowful. But guess what? You can use that sorrow. Call on to the Most High, call on His name. You know, use your sorrow to pray, use your sorrow to cry, use your sorrow. To sweat, <laughs> and when God sees your sorrow, He will see that, and He'll bring deliverance. Amen. Yeah. Proverbs fourteen thirteen. He's writing it down. He said, "Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness." Sometimes we can laugh, we can joke, but our hearts are sorrowful, and God sees that. So just as much as we laugh and have joy, we also can't be afraid to cry out and use our tears and our prayer to God. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 15, 13. Going through a lot of scriptures. Just write them down. Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Okay, so we want to manage our sorrow we don't want to let our sorrow control us. We want to control our sorrow. Okay, your spirit can be broken. But you don't want to let your spirit be broken. You want to manage the sorrow and control it and use it for your advantage, for your deliverance. Cry out to God in prayer. Don't let your spirit be broken by sorrow. But use your sorrow to pray, to call out, to cry before him, to pour out your heart before the Lord. Just like Hannah. Remember what the, what the scripture said about Hannah? She was a woman of sorrowful spirit and she was pouring out her heart before the Lord. That's what she was managing her sorrow. She was. And God answered her. Okay? Proverbs 23 29. It says, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? Who hath redness of eyes? And it goes on to say, those that drink too much wine, those that linger at the mixed, at the mixed wine, right? So we don't want to manage our sorrow with alcohol. We don't want to drink the pain away. 
right? Drinking the pain away is not helpful to manage our sorrow. Okay, we need to use our sorrow to pour out our heart before the Lord, to pray, okay, to cry out. Um, you can't drink the pain away. I used to joke around and say, well, maybe I can eat the pain away, you know? But you can't do that either. You can't eat the pain away. You can't, even though, you know, some brownies would be be tasty right about now, some chocolate cake, it would be good, some ice cream, make you feel better, but you can't eat the pain away. You have to use your sorrow to cry. You have to use your sorrow to lift up your hands. You have to use your sorrow to pour out your heart before the Lord. You can't drink the pain away. You can't eat the pain away because that chocolate cake cannot deliver you. <laughs> that chocolate cake is not going to save the day. The chocolate cake and the ice cream is not going to give you a godly child. The chocolate cake is not going to give you a deliverer. The chocolate cake is not going to cause your sons to fight the battles of the Lord. Okay, only the Most High can do that. So we cannot eat the pain away. We cannot drink the pain away. We have to call on the Most High. We have to manage our sorrow and manage our sweat. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 7.3. Just write it down. You don't have to go there because we got a lot, a lot of scriptures. Sorrow is better than laughter. It says sorrow is better than laughter for by sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart is made better through sadness of the countenance. So he's not saying you got to be sad all the time. But what he's saying is your heart is made better by sorrow. When you make a mistake or when you when somebody dies or when you have a loss, you actually get wiser, right? Your heart is made better. Okay, so you can manage your sorrow and use it to get better. Use your sorrow to get better. Use a loss to get better. Use what's going on with the Mount Arbery to get better. Use what's going on, you know, with the loss, all the losses of life with this COVID-19, people getting killed in hospitals, people losing their life not knowing what's going on. We can use that to get better, to get smarter, to never be the same again. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, Ecclesiastes 11.10. It says, therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. So what is that talking about? That's talking about young people, okay? He says, childhood and youth are vanity. Now, let them have fun, let them do their, their thing. Okay, they can be wise, but don't weigh young people down with sorrow. Let them work, let them enjoy life sin free so we want to manage sorrow to the point where we're not putting it on our children okay that we're actually using it to make ourselves better and make our children better but not weighing them down too much lamentations 2 19 I actually turn to this one this is a good one i want y'all to remember to look at these words right here lamentations 2 19 it says Say amen when you get there. <laughs> Lamentations 2.19. Hey, Valerie, how you doing? Amen. Amen. All right, it says, Arise, cry out in the night. In the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. That sound familiar? Remember Hannah? She poured out her... Pour out her heart before the Lord. Pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands towards him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Okay, so in these times when our young children are dying, when they've got abortion clinics on the corner of every street, when they got gangs on the corner of every street, when they got drugs on the corner of every street, when they got police you know, waiting to kill on the corner of every street. Pour out your heart like water before the Lord. Lift up your hands toward him for the life of thy young children. So we can use our sorrow to pour out our heart like water before the face of the Lord. 
Okay, what happens when we do that? Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, verse 1. It says, Sing, O barren, thou that did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. Thou that did not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, says the Lord. So when we start to cry out, when we start to call on the Most High, when we start to pour our hearts like water before the Lord, He comes with deliverance. And the barren ends up being more blessed than the one who has the children. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. Okay, so when we read Isaiah, or when we read Isaiah 54, um, the tribe of Judah. Isaiah chapter 54, now we go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 27, it says, Rejoice thou, barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate have many more children than she which hath an husband. So in this scripture, it's talking about how um, those that weren't in the covenant, they got into the covenant through Christ. And they, the ones that were desolate had, much, had more children than the married woman, right? And so, when just like Hannah, when she didn't have any children and she cried out to the Lord, God answered her, gave her a son, and that son turned out to be a deliverer. That's the same thing that happens when we when we are restored, when we are restored as a people, when we are restored as believers, it makes us fruitful. You know, it makes us fruitful. It's not just um, you know, so we can say, Oh, we we blessed now. No, it makes us actually fruitful. It makes us to, it allows us to make disciples. It allows us to have godly children. It allows us to build things that we couldn't build before. Restoration makes you fruitful. Um, Isaiah 14, 3 says, It shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou was made to serve. So this is a pattern you see in Exodus when they were in hard bondage and sorrow. God delivered them and made them and gave them rest from it. Here in Isaiah, it's saying the same thing. So the pattern is clear, okay? The hard bondage, the sweat, the sorrow, when we manage our sweat and we manage our sorrow, God will give us rest. We manage our sorrow, we manage our sweat, we use it for the correct reasons. We pour it out before the Lord, okay? Deliverance comes. Isaiah 51. Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah 51 verse 11. It says, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be on their head and they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. So once again, the deliverance comes when we call out to the Most High, when we use our sorrow and we call out to Him. Psalms 30, verse 5. Psalms 30 says, For His anger endures but a moment. In His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. That's a famous scripture. We hear it quoted all the time. But it's so true. It's so true. As anger is just a moment. You know, your suffering is only one page. You got hundreds and hundreds of pages, right? And his favor is life. Weeping endures only for a night. But joy comes in the morning. When that sun comes out, the sadness is over. When that deliverance comes, you're going to forget the sorrow. Amen? Um... Let's look at Isaiah 53. Turn a couple chapters over. Isaiah chapter 53. And we see that Jesus himself 
What does it say about Jesus? Verse 4, he says, Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did... Um, actually, let's start at verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely we, he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and afflicted. So Jesus himself was a man of sorrows. He was a man of sorrows. He was one that he went before God and bore our sins. Okay? It says he carried our sorrows. <laughs> We didn't even know enough to be sorrowful. We was happy in our sin, right? He carried our sorrow to the Most High. He carried our sorrow for us. He carried our sweat for us. He worked for us to give us, to bring us deliverance, to bring us salvation. He carried the sorrow and he carried the sweat for us. Okay? So, Jesus, Jesus is the one that delivered us with his sorrow and with his sweat. So this is a consistent, consistent pattern. Let's go to John. John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And then I'm going to quote Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is kind of a... Um, Another prophecy related to Isaiah 53. You can just write that down. It says, I'm poured out like water. <clears throat> All my bones are out of joint. Joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. So that's Jesus talking about his death on the cross. He said he was poured out like water. Okay. He was poured out like water. The sweat and the sorrow, the tears were poured out. His body, his, literally his blood, was poured out. John 16, verse 20, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Isn't that going on right now? We are weeping and lamenting, but the world is rejoicing. The unbelievers, the sinners are rejoicing, right? It says, You shall be sorrowful. But your sorrow shall be turned into joy. So when we are sorrowful, our sorrow will be turned into joy. It says, verse 21, A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. So this this sorrow that we have as believers, you know, the fact that we live in a world of sin, the lack, the fact that we are persecuted, the fact that Jesus is not back yet, and we long for His to, and we want Him to return, right? This, the things that we see going wrong in the world, and we're sorrowful because of that. But it says our sorrow will be turned into joy, and the deliverer will come. Our Savior will come. Okay. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians. Actually, no, 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. We're talking about managing your sorrow and managing your sweat. 2 Corinthians 7.10. It says, For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Okay, so the sorrow of the world worketh death. What is the sorrow of the world? Being sorry but not repenting. Being sorry but not keeping his commandments. Being sad but not letting your sorrow change you. But the sorrow, godly sorrow, causes us to repent. Causes us to keep his commandments. Causes us to change. Causes us to self-reflect and look in and say, you know what? I need to change. Okay? So, we have to manage our sorrow and we have to manage our sweat. We have to manage 
and use it to our advantage. We have to use our sorrow to actually turn our hearts to God. We have to use our sorrow to turn them. Happy to keep turning the lights on. And that one. So, um. So we have to manage, uh, manage our sorrow and use it to our advantage. God has given us, yeah. God has given us, um, He's given us tools, right? He's given us, um, he's given us these tools so we can use them to pour out to him. So when we see things going wrong in the world, we know what to do. We know to cry out to him. We know to pour out our heart like water before the Lord. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the sweat too, the sweat side of it, right? But we can pour out these things before God, and we can see, and we can know, and we can believe, and we know that God hears. God hears, and God sees. God sees the blood, he sees the sweat, he sees the tears, okay? So encouragement, so we have to manage our sorrow and our sweat. And as we sorrow and as we sweat, we have to be encouraged. We have to encourage ourselves in our sorrow. And we have to encourage ourselves in our sweat. No tears, no deliverance. If we look at these patterns, all these scriptures we just looked at, and some of them I even skipped over, right? <laughs> you know? Pattern. And we know that if there's no tears, there's no deliverance. Okay, we can complain all we want. We can protest all we want. <laughs> you know, we can be mad all we want. We put our fist up all we want. But with no tears, there's no deliverance. God is up there waiting. He wants to see the sorrow. He wants to see the sorrow that leads to repentance. He wants to see the sorrow that leads to tears. He wants to see the sorrow, you know, that that will show him that it's time to come and deliver and to send deliverance. No sorrow, no deliverance. No tears, no deliverance. No sweat, no deliverance. They had to put their time in. They, they had to work. They had to handle the work that he wanted them to do. Okay, before the deliverance came. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. How long, O Lord? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. It says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, with what strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered so jesus himself he offered up prayers with strong crying and tears so there has to be a, a tear a tearful prayer a tearful cry for deliverance to come. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah chapter 38, verse five. This is Hezekiah, just a little snippet. Go and say to Hezekiah, thus saith the, the Lord, the God of David, thy father. I have heard thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thy days 15 years. So for praying, just like Jesus with strong crying and tears, he had 15 years added to his life. That's how God sees tears. Tears are valuable. Tears are valuable. Tears are valuable to God in prayer. We have to understand this. 
we want deliverance, we have to understand that tears are valuable. We have to cry out and pour our heart like water before the Lord. Pour out our hearts like water before the Lord. Psalms 126. Psalms 126. Verse 4, it says, Turn again our captivity, O Yahuwah, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. They have to sow in tears to reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Okay, so the tears... Those that sow in tears reap in joy. No tears, no deliverance. No sweat, no deliverance. Okay? So, in sorrow, but guess what? Those children also bring deliverance. In sweat shall you toil and labor as a man. Okay? But guess what? You'll eat from that sweat. God will reward you for that sweat. Amen. God will reward you for the work that you put in. God will reward you for your sweat. So God rewards us for God rewards us for the sorrow that we go through in life. So we keep our mind on that to give us keep us encouraged. Um let's go to Isaiah chapter 61. Got about 500 scriptures tonight, y'all. 500. 500. Isaiah <laughs> 1, verse 7. It says, For your shame you shall have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. So for the shame for the sorrow that we get from being in a land that is not ours and being oppressed and being taught, thought of as the lowest, we shall have what? Double. <laughs> and we shall rejoice in our portion. Okay, so the deliverance is coming. I'm going to read a few more uh, scriptures. Just We don't have to turn to them. I'm just going to read them. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So we sorrow. We don't sorrow with no hope. We sorrow knowing that our sorrow is going to lead to deliverance because we know that Jesus is returning. So when somebody does die, we're not, you know, sorrowing like being depressed, but we're sorrowing knowing that there's hope in the future, knowing that Jesus is soon to return. Psalm 113.9, he says, He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. So barren woman, he will make them to, to keep house and be a joyful mother of children. So the sorrow, just like Hannah, the sorrow that she had was turned into joy because God gave a, a child for deliverance. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, it says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So the affliction that we are suffering, the, the reproach, the shame that we are suffering, is going to give us a far more eternal weight of glory, a reward. Remember that when they came out of Egypt, they came with silver and gold and with strength. Okay, so the eternal, and that's just in the natural now in the spiritual kingdom, we're going to have an even more eternal weight of glory for the suffering that we go through for our faith. Amen? That's good. Revelation 21, verse 4. It says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So there will be a time when all the tears will be done. Hallelujah. There will be a time when there will be no more pain, nor sorrow, nor death. But for now, we have to manage our sorrow and use it to accelerate us to that time. We have to manage our sweat and use it to accelerate us to that time. Okay? And we have to be encouraged in our sorrow. We have to be encouraged 
and our sweat because we know that it's temporary and God is going to use it to deliver us. So do men cry? Yes, they cry. But usually women tend to be more emotional. So women tend to cry out to the Most High with tears. Do women work? Yes, women work. But men's muscles are bigger. We sweat more. So men cry out to God with sweat, with the work that we put in, <laughs> okay? With the work that we put in before the Lord. Okay, so a most valuable woman, MVP woman, is one that can pray to God with her whole heart while she works. Her tears are an offering, okay? A woman's tears as she prays before God can be an offering and God can use that to deliver. Um, um, a most valuable man is the one that can sweat before God as he prays. One that can work hard and labor and toil and work unto the Lord and pray unto the Lord, right? His work is unto the Lord. So the men, the women offer to God their tears, their prayers, their emotions while they're working, while they're laboring, while they're doing their thing. They're crying out to God and God will deliver, deliver and hear them and deliver based on their prayers and based on their tears. A man, he cries out to God. He prays while he's working, while he's sweating, while he's in the toil of his labor, okay? While he's in the sweat of his brow, shall you eat? And God will bless that man's work if he works unto the Lord, okay? I can remember um, my wife, she's very emotional <laughs> and um, it can be challenging, you know, to have a wife that's emotional, but it's also a great blessing, a great blessing. To have a wife that <laughs> prays <laughs> emotionally, right? <laughs> and so, it's a quick story. A couple years back, I was working a job, and I was actually, you know, trying to stick it out. You know, I was sticking it out. I was like, well, let's wait to see what they do. You know. I'll stick with them and see what's going on and see how they how they respond or whatever. So I was sticking it out. Serena, she was like, uh-uh, we're going to get you a new job. <laughs> She's like, I'm praying. I'm praying that you would get a job. She told me she was praying. I wasn't even looking for a new job at the point. She was like, I'm praying you get a job making at least double or triple. <laughs> um, that it would be in this area. You wouldn't have to travel as much. And it would be a job that I would like. This is before I was even looking for a new job. She was praying on that, right? And work from home. <laughs> and she wanted me to work from home. Oh my goodness. And I was traveling, right? So, lo and behold, I guess maybe a month or two months later, okay, I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm done. They started, I started looking for a new job. Guess what kind of job I got? <laughs> One making double to triple what I was making at the time. Work from home. And it was a job that I like. Right. And it was local. And it was local, right? Yeah. And so... <laughs> and so... Before I even... You know, she was praying that. like, And she cried out to God with her heart. And God answered her prayer. Right? And so it can be very powerful for us to use our tears to cry out to God, just like that woman Hannah. She poured out her heart before the Lord, and God answered, right? Um, so a woman's tears can be an offering, and she uses her emotions, her sorrow, to ask God for deliverance. You know, it can be a very powerful thing. It's very valuable to have a woman that can use her emotions and pour them out before God. It's a blessing. Amen. Psalms 104. <clears throat> Psalms 104. Psalms 104. 
verse 23. It says, man goes forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening. Everybody say, until, until the, evening. the evening. The man, the valuable man, is the one that can work unto the Lord. Okay, women work, but their value, they're not as strong as men, so their value is in their their tears, the sweat, the tears. The men, men do cry, but we're made to sweat, <laughs> right? Remember in the scripture, Genesis chapter 3, it said the woman has sorrow and sorrow. And when she pours out her sorrow before the Lord, she gets deliverance. Men have sorrow and sweat. And when we work unto the Lord, we get the blessing. Okay? Okay, so a man has to go forth into his work until the evening, into his labor until the evening. So a valuable man is a man that can sweat before the Lord and stay holy, right? They can pray unto God while he's working and to, you know, offer his work, offer his sweat unto the Lord as an offering. Okay, not a man that you know, was working and then going to the strip club afterward or working and thinking about committing adultery with the woman right next to him, right? The man that can work before the Lord and offer his sweat as an offering to the Lord. So remember, we're talking about managing our sorrow and our sweat, managing our, encouraging us ourselves in our sorrow and in our sweat without any tears, with no tears, there's no deliverance. With no sweat, there's no deliverance. So what if we want deliverance, if we want God to come and to respond, we have to give him our tears. We have to give him our sweat. Okay? And the women have to pour out their hearts before the Lord. The men have to pour out their hearts before the Lord in their sweat. The women have to pour out their hearts before the Lord in their tears. Let's go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verse 4. It said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Then it said, The night cometh when no man can work. So he, Jesus said he had to work while it was day. And the night was coming when no man can work. What did he mean there? Okay, he meant that, okay, it was only a certain amount of time to preach the gospel. It was only a certain amount of time to do the work that he was calling to do. Because pretty soon it was time to be crucified. He wasn't going to be able to do anything at that time, right? Um, so what can we get from that? There's a certain time to put in your work. Even Ecclesiastes, the same, uh, our Lamentations, where he talked about, told the women to pour out their hearts before the Lord. It also has a scripture in there that says it's good for a young man to bear the yoke in his youth. Right? So, men have to work at the right time. We talked about athletics. <laughs> you don't want to start your NBA career when you're 65, right? It's too late. You work while it's day. <laughs> work while you got the strength, right? You want to study your school, but you want to get your engineering degree, right? You want to get your, you want to get your study on. You want to learn how to read, do math and business before you become, before you get married, right? <laughs> Work while it's day. The night comes when no man can work. Amen? So we want to work while it's day. A man has to offer his work to the Lord at the right time. He goes forth unto his work until the evening. Okay? He said, work while it is day. For the night cometh when no man can work. Proverbs 14, um, Proverbs 14, verse 23. Proverbs 14, 23, it says, In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tends only to penury or poverty or lack. So in all labor there is profit. So when a man goes forth into his work into the evening, when he works during the day, because the night is coming when no man can work, okay, he is actually getting the wealth that God wants to bring to him because in all labor there is profit. But talk of the lips tends only to penury. A couple chapters back, Proverbs chapter 12, 
verse 24. It said, The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Okay, so working in the sweat of your brow. Diligence. And when you're diligent, you shall bear rule. But when you're slothful and you don't work while it is day. And when you don't go forth into your work, then you end up under tribute. You end up in the slavery. Okay, so what are some different ways for the men to sweat? We already talked about the tears, the prayer. So let's talk about the sweat. What are different ways for a man to sweat? Okay, a man sweats through physical labor. That's the first way. Agriculture, getting out in the dirt. Dirt is a workout, man. <laughs> you don't need no weights if you got dirt. Dirt is a workout. Moving that dirt, planting plants, growing food. That's why he told him. He said, in the sweat of your brow shall you eat. Okay, agriculture, mining, getting that gold, getting that silver out of the, out of the rocks, getting the platinum out, mining copper. That stuff is work. Okay, there's different ways to sweat. Hunting, you know, Finding the animals, killing the animals, that's how you get your, some of your food, right? That's sweat. The man has to work. Building, working with your hands, all right? Um, it's scripture in Ephesians says, work with your hands, the thing that is good, right? Um, engineering, Ecclesiastes 12. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. A lot of y'all didn't know. Y'all didn't know that engineering was in the Bible, did you? See, I'm about, to, I'm about to show you a little something. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 11. It says, The words of the wise are as golds and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. What is a master of assembly? One that masters how to assemble something together. Whether it's something mechanical or something electrical or a computer program, a computer software. When you're assembling something together, you're a master of assembly. You're an engineer, okay? So engineering is another way to work, to sweat. So we got agriculture, we got mining, we got hunting, we got building. Working with your hands, construction. Okay, that's Jesus was a carpenter, right? Work with your hands, a thing that is good. We have engineering, being a master of assembly. We can put that into the work of the mind too, right? What is another way to sweat? Let's turn to Proverbs, back to Proverbs verse, uh, Proverbs chapter 31. It says, she looketh, ways to, she looketh well to the ways of her household. And eateth not the bread of idleness. Yes, men are the primary sweat makers in the earth. We were the ones that God told, <laughs> in the sweat of your brow shall you eat, right? But women also do, do some work as well. They do a lot of work. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Okay, so different ways to sweat. Physical labor, hard focus, hard challenge. If you want to be delivered, if you want to eat, if you want well, find some sweat. Find a way to sweat, okay? Find, do something hard. Do something that gives you a focus. Do something that gives you a challenge. That's how the deliverance comes. That's how the wealth comes, right? God saw their sorrow. He saw their labors from their taskmasters, and he rewarded them for it. God will always reward somebody that puts in work. Let's turn to Psalms chapter 147. Now you're going to talk about the, the sports and athletics as we mentioned, right? So, uh, Psalms 147. It says, verse 10. It says, He delights not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the leg of a man the Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him and that hope in his mercy can you sweat with your sports can you sweat playing basketball of course
Can you sweat playing football? Of course, right? Can you sweat out in the war, right? You can, right? But the Lord does not take pleasure in the legs of a man or the strength of a horse. Okay, so yes, you can sweat in athletics, but it's not going to be the end-all, be-all. Okay, you're not going to be able to fight forever. You're not going to be able to dunk forever. You're not going to be able to bang your head in a helmet forever, right? And so, yes, athletics, you can you can sweat in athletics. You can sweat in warfare. You can sweat, you know, in competition, but that's not something that can last forever. So we have to find other ways to sweat in addition to our exercise, right? Even, this, even the scripture in 1 Timothy says, bodily exercise profits little, but godliness profits eternally, right? So we have to keep sports in their right place. It's not a sin, right? You can definitely be competitive in athletic things and the physical things. We have to keep it in the right perspective and we have to find other ways to sweat, right? Other ways that are productive to sweat. All right, what's the third way? What's another way to sweat? We talked about the physical side of sweat, the hard focus, the physical, the agriculture, the mining, the hunting, the building, the building, the engineering, uh, managing the household, athletics, right? So what's another way to sweat with your mind? Let's turn, let's turn to Psalms 144, a couple chapters over. Verse one, it said, Blessed be Yahuwah my strength, which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight. High pressure, high pressure situations, okay? High pressure, high risk business, high pressure, high risk war. David was a professional warrior. He was, he was in some high pressure situations. That's where we get all these songs. He was crying out like, Lord, save me from my enemy. You know, he was sweating. He had pressure and God delivered him in his sweat. God delivered him in his war. God delivered him in his fight. He said, God, teach my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Okay, let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. It says, not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, Serving the Lord. What does fervent mean? Hot. You know, if something's fervent, that means you're sweating. That means you're supposed to be sweating in business. Do something that gives you some heat. It makes gives your armpits a little bit of wetness under it, right? Put some pressure on yourself. Do something that's challenging. Okay? Do some high pressure. High risk. Big risk business. I used to call it big risk business. That's why you throw so many concerts. Big risk business. You got to put pressure on yourself if you want to sweat and you want and you want God to reward your sweat, you have to have pressure. Another form of sweat, high risk, high risk, high pressure situations. Let's go to Luke. Um, Luke chapter four. Okay, war, business, engineering. These are mental, mental sweat, right? Luke chapter four, what's another way, way to men- sweat mentally? Smet, sweat mentally is being a physician. Luke four, verse 23, it says, you will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Okay, when you're a physician and you want to heal others, there's going to be some pressure on you. They're going to say, can you heal yourself? Right? Oh, you want to help me lose weight? Can you lose weight? Oh, you want to help me heal from cancer? What happened when you get cancer? Right? There's, pr- there's pressure on physicians. There's pressure. You know? Let's go over to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Verse 32. Verse 31, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And when Jesus said unto them, Go you, go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow. Okay. And the third day I will be perfected. So there's pressure 
when you're healing people, when you're casting out devils, when you're delivering people's physical bodies from certain things, there's pressure. They tell Harry gonna come and kill you for doing this stuff. He's like, man, tell that fox I'm gonna keep healing people. Tell him. I don't care what he say. Right? So when you heal people, there's pressure on to you. There's pressure. You know, that's why so many lawsuits against doctors, also why insurance is so high, right? Because if you make a mistake, they're gonna try to sue you, right? Pressure from the government. Well, you gotta do these certain treatments. You can't do this, you can't do that. They don't want you healing people. They just want you to sell them medicine. There's pressure when you're a physician. Okay, so that's part, that's a form of sweat. Okay, so physical labor, hard focus, hard challenge, that's a way to sweat. Agriculture, mining, hunting, building, okay, managing the household, athletics, war, there's mental sweat, high pressure, high risk, war, business, okay, being, not being slothful in business, putting pressure on yourself, being a physician to heal people, right, that puts pressure on you, puts pressure from the people that you're trying to heal, it also puts pressure on you from authorities that don't want you to heal people, right, that's pressure. But guess what? God rewards that sweat. He rewards you when you sweat physically. He rewards you when you sweat mentally. Okay? Even when you're doing mental work, you still need to sweat. Okay? You need to put, put some heat on yourself. <laughs> put some heat on yourself. Put some big risk in there. Um, third way to sweat. Spiritually, fervent, heartfelt prayer and preaching. Let's go to Matthew 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26. Verse 38. Uh, verse 38. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. Okay. Um, so Jesus prayed and he was extremely sorrowful even unto death. And let's see, where's the scripture that says? Well, there's another scripture that said he prayed until tears came out. Where is that? Let me find that right quick. Is it in Mark or Luke? Huh? It's in Luke? It's Luke. Twenty-two forty-four. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Luke. So Jesus prayed so hard that he sweated. Sweat came. Okay, so he was pouring out his heart before the Lord. So that's the spiritual sweat. So we can sweat physically. We can sweat mentally. We could also sweat spiritually. 1 Timothy 5, 17. 1 Timothy 5. First Timothy 5. Verse 17, it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. We can labor in the word and doctrine. We can put in work and sweat in the word and in doctrine. Let's go to Book of Acts. The Book of Acts. Whenever I get a new topic, we just do a lot of scriptures. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 
31. It says, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So the work of an apostle is a work that gives out sweat and tears. You are in prayer, you are warning people night and day with tears because you're praying for them, okay? And then of course we talk about the Tabernacle of David. They were employed in their work of singing and playing musician, playing music before the Lord. It says they were employed in that work day and night. I think that says the Second Chronicles. And then we talk about the wall of Jericho. What happened when God, before God gave them deliverance in the wall of Jericho? Okay, what did they do? They marched around it for seven days, and then they shouted, right? And God delivered them. I think there was a little bit of sweat walking around in the desert for. Mm-hmm. For seven days, okay, God responded. And then praising and dancing is right, seven days. And they were praising and shouting, and God delivered them. Okay, so even when you're doing spiritual work, you still need to sweat. <laughs> Jesus sweated when he prayed. The apostles prayed night and day with tears. You need to pour out something. You need to sweat. Okay, we need to have poured our, our tears. We need to pour out our sweat before the Lord. We need to shout. We need to dance. We need to praise. Um, we need to sing. We need to play our instruments before the Lord with sweat. Okay? We need to challenge something. Challenge something, not just verbally, but spiritually. We need to put some heat <laughs> into what we're doing. We need to be fervent in spirit serving the Lord, right? Not just going with the status quo, but challenge some principalities. Challenge some false doctrines challenge something like we need to fight something put some sweat and some pressure under our armpits I like that. when we doing God's work don't just take the easy way out. Oh, I don't want to rock the boat no rock both boats <laughs> rock all the boats <laughs> with, with truth you know we need to put our some pressure on ourselves in the kingdom in, our, in ministry we need to put some because if we want deliverance with no sweat there's no deliverance with no tears there's no deliverance. We need to put some pressure on these principalities. Yeah. We need to put some pressure on the demons and the false doctrines that are holding our people bound up. Put some pressure on them. Put some heat on them. Not in a carnal way, you know. Not in a just trying to piss people off or make people mad way. But challenging the devil. Challenging the lies. That's what we need to do. We need some heat. Okay. Psalms 127, verse 2. It says, It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. You know, when we give God, when we go forth into our work until the evening, we can get rest. We don't have to kill ourselves. <laughs> you know, we don't have to eat the bread of sorrows. You know, we can, he gives us sleep. Yes, in our sweat and our sorrow, he does reward us for that. But guess what? He also gives us rest. As a matter of fact, when he sees us working, he gives us rest. And he gives us the reward for our work. Proverbs 10, 22, it says, The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. So there is a deliverance that comes with the blessing of the Lord. There is a deliverance when you put in your tears. You petition him. You pour out your heart before him. You pour out your sweat before him. There's a deliverance that comes, and then there's no more sorrow with it. It's the same pattern. So we need the weeping, the wailing women. When we see these new stories, when we see the condition of our people, when we see the condition of the body of Christ, we need to cry. We need to allow our emotions to flow before him. We need the weeping and the wailing women. We need those like Hannah that will just go to the temple and pour out her heart. And they're like, is she drunk? No, I'm just a woman of sorrow. I'm calling out to the Lord. Right? We need that. If we want to be delivered, we need that. We need the weeping women. Okay? We need the Anna. We need the ones that's 
that, that lost her husband at a young age and she just went to the temple and started praying night and day and fasting. We need the Hannahs and the Hannahs to cry out if we want deliverance. We need the shouting and the working men, the men that will sweat before the Lord like David, dance until his clothes, you know, <laughs> he was sweating, dancing. He was pouring out his heart before the Lord. Scripture even said he would not give himself rest till he saw a place for the Lord, a house for the holy of Jacob. We need the laboring men, the, warf the men of warfare that will sweat in holiness and sweat before the Lord and give him praise and worship and work before him and use physical, physical sweat, mental sweat, and spiritual sweat at the same time. We need mighty men that will go before the Lord like Simeon. Simeon in the same chapter, Luke, where Anna was, also was Simeon. He, was, he wasn't a priest. He was a working man that came to the temple and he believed for the salvation of Israel. So he knew how to sweat in his work. He knew how to sweat physically, but he also knew how to come to the temple. And he was so deep in the spirit, in his prayer life, that when he saw baby Jesus, he was able to recognize this is the Savior. That was a mighty man, okay? It, he wasn't even a priest, right? He was a laborer. He knew how to sweat physically. He knew how to sweat in business, but he also knew how to sweat in prayer to the point where God was able to show him the deliverance. Okay, so we need the, the Hannahs. We need the Annas. We need the weeping and wailing women. We need the Davids. We need the Simeons. We need the working and warring and praying and praising men if we want to see deliverance. You know how they say, bless, sweat, and tears, right? That's a, a common a phrase, bless, sweat, and tears. Well, guess what? Jesus gave the blood. Ooh, <laughs> men give the sweat. We go to work. We work spiritually, we work physically, we work mentally, we sweat. Our women give the tears. Women cry out. They pray. They use their emotions and they manage their emotions and use them to pour out before the Lord in prayer. And then the most high hears. Jesus gave his blood. Men, we give the sweat. Our women give the tears. And the most high hears. It's a little rhyme, a little song. We can make, maybe write or something. <laughs> right? Okay. Jesus gave the blood. Men gave the sweat. Women give the tears. The Most High, He hears and He sees. As we pour out our hearts before Him, we pour out our sweat before Him. Deliverance comes swiftly. Amen? Amen. All right, so Father, we thank you, Lord, for helping us to manage our sorrow, to manage our sweat. Father, we thank you for giving us our tears. We thank you for giving us the ability to sweat before you. We pray that um, we would use our tears, both men and women, that we would cry out to you and use our emotions to turn our hearts towards you. We pray that we would use our sweat, Father, our physical labor, our mental labor, our spiritual labor, that we would cry out day and night um, and put pressure on ourselves, Father, um, to labor before you to labor night and day in prayer, to pray, Lord, with fervency, Father, to do our work with fervency, Father, to sweat, Lord, before you in holiness, Father, to sweat before you and give it to you as an offering, Father, to give our work to you as an offering, to give our tears to you as an offering, Father. And we thank you that as we give our, as Jesus, because Jesus gave his blood, Father, we can give you our sweat, we can give you our tears, and you will hear, and you will deliver, and you will save. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.